The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret society, to secret oath, and to secret proceedings. Waking humanity, one soul at a time. This is The World You Don't Know Radio Show with your host, Nick O'Connell. Now, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You're very welcome along to this week's edition of The World You Don't Know with myself, Mick O'Connell. Um, I'm on my own tonight. I don't have a guest for tonight. Um, but one thing I will be talking about is the chemtrailing agenda. And this is a subject I've covered many times on the show before. I've even had a couple of guests on to talk about it. Terry Lawton and Harry Rose over in the UK was on a couple of times talking about chemtrails. And the reason I'm talking about it tonight is with the... Clocks going forward, I suppose, and the evening's getting longer and the blue skies now becoming more frequent as we sort of leave the winter. Um, it seems to me that there's an awful lot more spraying going on, especially in the last two to three days. Now, we've noticed that over the last couple of days, and I'm not the only person. People who would ordinarily not even be discussing, you know, issues like chemtrails, they wouldn't be aware of it or anything like that. But um, one thing I've noticed now is there's an awful lot of spraying going on the last couple of days. And it's ridiculous. I mean, you, you can get up out of bed at 6 o'clock in the morning and have a look out and you've got a nice clear blue sky. Sun is blazing. And then by 12 o'clock, you've got so many lines crisscrossing the sky that they form a milky blanket, completely blocking out the sun. I mean, the sun is behind the haze now for most of the day. And this has now become a normal. I mean, you're even getting TV programmes now where... They're constantly showing your chemtrails in the background. So, you know, if you're a child watching that, that's just, you know, there's nothing out, out of place to you. But if you're someone of my age, like I'm nearly 46, or people who are older than that, and even some people who are younger than me, can remember a time growing up when you didn't notice so many trails in the sky that we had good, clear blue skies throughout the summer. But you would, you know, you'd see the old plane passing over. And don't get me wrong, I know there's a lot more plane traffic nowadays than there would have been say back in the 80s you know with flights being cheaper and stuff like that so they're a lot more frequent but a lot of these flights that are flying and you know laying these chemtrails are not domestic flights or flights to and from uh, the UK these are long haul flights that are flying so high up in the sky that you know there's no prospect of them landing in this country they're flying over this country and they're laying these lines down in the sky and completely blocking out the sun. Now, I don't know if there's an agenda going on. There's certainly talk all over the internet that there is a nefarious agenda going on, with several agendas. One of them is that they're deliberately trying to poison humanity from the air. Now, I mean, if you just look at all the crap that's in our food as well, so, you know, they're sort of getting us both ways, with fluoride in the water, etc. The amount of E-numbers that are in foods now. I mean, the, the food most children eat nowadays is just a, a concoction of chemicals. You know, it's the kind of food that doesn't even go off. There's that much preservative in it. It's not real food. It's just junk food. You know, we've got obesity levels in this country off the charts. We've got diabetes levels in this country off the charts. You know, we've got a, a myriad of illnesses that weren't around even 30 years ago, but are around nowadays. And I, myself, my own opinion is that there is something going on. There is an agenda because, as I said, I can remember a time when... There, was very little spraying going on in the skies. And if there was, I certainly didn't notice it, but I can certainly remember clear blue skies. But now, it's that bad, you can't even see, you know, proper sunlight. And I remember reading a report not so long ago that Ireland is one of the most vitamin D deficient countries in Europe, or probably the world. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, don't get me wrong, we've always known the Irish weather has always been miserable. I mean, you just have to watch the movie Angela's Ashes. I mean, it never stopped raining in the film, so we're used to that kind of weather. But we're also used to having nice, decent summers. You know, even if it is only about five or six weeks of good, pure shun sunshine. And, you know, you get the odd rain rainy day in between. But, you know, on the whole, most of our summers, you know, they, they can be... Not super hot like what you'd get in Spain and places like that or in Florida, but we, you know, by Irish standards, a decent summer. But we don't even get that anymore. I remember now throughout the, the 90s and into the noughties, we had a lot of miserable summers, you know, there was a lot of stormy, rainy summers, glum summers, where we didn't get a lot of sunshine. And we were just putting that down to all crappy Irish weather and, you know, the world has changed, we've got climate change and all this stuff going on. But, um, 
I think there's more to it than that. Now, there's been... I've seen plenty of documentaries online, I will admit, but um, you won't see these kind of documentaries on mainstream TV, saying that there is weather modification agendas taking place all around the world, and weather has been used as a weapon. Now, you think about this. Weather has been used as a weapon. Well, how would they do that? I mean, you've got things like HARP, for example, the high auroral um, relay thing. I don't, I'm not sure what exactly what HARP stands for, but it's in various places around the world. I think the biggest one is in Alaska. And they're run by military. And what they do is they send microwaves high up into the atmosphere, up into the stratosphere, and they bounce them back down again. And these in turn then have detrimental effects on the weather. I mean, for example, even on 9 11. One of the strange things about 9-11, I just I know I'm going off course here, but one of the strange things about 9-11 on the day was that a hurricane was heading towards New York City and it was diverted. Believe it or believe it or not. Now, you can look this up on the internet yourself. It's a, a bit of a, a folklore story sur- surrounding 9-11, but there was a, a storm heading towards New York on that day and it was diverted. And some people are saying that something like harp was probably used to um, help divert it. Now, I don't know if this is true or not, but this is one of the stories that I read online uh, many, many moons ago. So, when you think of that, you know, the military controlling the weather, it, it can be good for business. If you want to take a country down, for example, um, you know, say a country like Syria, where it, it's a nice hot country and say they can grow food all year round and, you know, have a, a good climate for growing stuff. What if you flood that country year on year on year with storms? And you, you kill all the crops. You know, that's one way of taking down the country. So, you know, even though most people say, oh, that's just a conspiracy, you know, them controlling the weather, there are plenty of historical reports that do talk about the military, particularly the US military, having the ability to control the weather. And this is nothing new. This goes way back into the 50s where they were cloud seeding, you know, to make it rain. Now, remember um, the socialite who died there recently, um, Tara Parma Tompkinson, um, she died, funny enough, under mysterious circumstances. Uh, she was probably bumped off. She was on a talk show, la- I think it was last year or the year before, one of these panel shows in the UK, and the subject of weather modification came up. Um, I think someone was talking about chemtrails, I'm not sure. But the subject came up, and she piped up all, you know, sort of innocent, saying that um, her daddy, for her 24... So her daddy is, um, I think, Lord Goldsmith, I think, um, very wealthy man, but for her 21st birthday party, he paid a private company in the UK to modify the weather around her house to make sure it didn't rain. Now, she said this herself on the show, and that daddy had paid, I don't know, a couple of hundred thousand euros or whatever it was, or pounds to the company to modify the weather to make sure it didn't rain on our house. Now, if they can do that, you know, I, I then go back to the chemtrailing agenda, what's going on? And the reason... There is something going on, in, in in my eyes, the reason I believe there's something nefarious going on is the fact that the powers that be, and Hollywood in particular, you know, those who make the movies, i.e., you know, these propaganda pieces, that's what most movies are. Um, and don't get me wrong, there's a bit of entertainment in between just to keep you uh, distracted. But most movies, particularly big blockbuster movies, usually have an agenda in them. They're trying to push an agenda. They're trying to... I uh, suppose condition you into a, a particular way of thinking but um, one thing they are doing with movies particularly old movies are re-editing re-editing the, the movies and what they're doing is they're editing in chemtrails into the films now I've noticed this with um, for example Ferris Bueller's Day Off there's a scene in that where he's outside the school in the movie and you see the camera panning across the sky in the original movie and it's a clear blue sky but if you get the updated DVD version of the movie and it's the, the, the very same scene when the camera pans across the sky, there's chemtrails in the scene. Another movie that I've seen this in is the the Italian job, the original Italian job, the one with Michael Caine. Now, you remember the famous scene at the end when the bus was hanging over the cliff? Well, there were some very, very wide um, camera panning shots, you know, probably taken from a helicopter or something where they're out in the middle of mid-air, like, taking these shots of the bus hanging over the edge of the cliff. And you can see the whole sky in the background, there's none of it hidden. But in the original movie, it's just a clear blue Mediterranean and Italian sky. I mean, you have to remember, that movie was filmed on location in Italy, so it was in the Mediterranean. And it's a nice clear blue sky, but if you look at the updated DVD version, the HD version of the Italian job, same saying, sky is full of chemtrails. So, 
like I said, even in cartoons now, you can watch cartoons, they're in cartoons, in The Simpsons, it, it's everywhere. And I believe that they're putting all this into modern movies and re-editing old movies. So when you go back and look at the old movie, you know, you stick Ferris Bueller's Day on, for example, or the Italian job, which is a 60s movie, and you see chemtrails in the background. So, but someone can, you know, look at you and say, there you go, look, so they were even there in the 1960s, but they weren't. They were not there. As I said, you can get the original version of this movie, have a look at it, that scene at the end, um, when the bus is hanging over the cliff, and there are no chemtrails whatsoever. But if you get the updated version, it's full of them. So that tells me that they're de deliberately going in and re-editing movies and deliberately putting chemtrails into movies nowadays to normalise it. So is anybody looking at chemtrails? So that's normal. They've always been there, but trust me, folks, they haven't. They have not always been there. So what is going on? Are they modifying the weather? Or is it an even more nefarious conspiracy? Are they trying to kill us off? I mean, who knows? I'm not saying they are trying to kill us off, but the fact that they're spraying something in the sky and if you ask official them what's going on, it denies all knowledge of what's going on. So why aren't they talking about it? Why aren't the mainstream media even mentioning chemtrails? You know, I, I think once on RTE, I remember seeing a weather forecast a few years back, and I think it's Evelyn Cusack, um, the black-haired lady. Now, she's a lovely lady. She's great at reading the weather. We're all used to seeing her after the 6 o'clock news doing the weather. But she was on it one day, and it was in the summertime, and they gave us one of these so-called satellite views of Ireland from space. And... It was just a wash with chemtrails, the whole country. There wasn't a, a patch of Ireland that didn't have them over it. And she mistakenly says, now, if you just look over Ireland there, it's full of chemtrails. Oh, sorry, I meant to say contrails. Like, she doubled back very, very quickly and realised the mistake that she made. But um, you can find that clip on YouTube. If you just Google um, Irish, I suppose, RT weather chemtrails, if you put those into a YouTube search, you'll find that clip. And it's quite funny. It really is a funny clip, but she referred to them as chemtrails. So that tells me that those in the in the meta and in the offices there who, you know, bring us to weather every day in the news, they're all well aware of these chemtrails. They're not stupid. You know, these people study the sky, they study cloud formations. That's their job. And yet they're not on the, the, the mainstream media saying, listen, folks, we've got all these new clouds now, these new shapes. Now, I seen clouds, I think it was the day before yesterday. And I'm not joking with you, there was one... You, you swear blind there was somebody up in the sky with a big stencil taking the piss because there was one, I'm not kidding you folks, it was the shape of the Starship Enterprise. I was expecting Kirk to come down and land beside us. Honest to God, it was the shape of the Starship Enterprise and there's been some weird clouds like that lately. Funny shapes. I'm not saying there's anything sinister about funny shaped clouds, but I don't remember clouds looking like that when I was growing up. As I said, you know, with all these chemicals that are getting sprayed now in the um, sky, it seems t to me that um, there's probably something going on, I don't know. But uh, anyway, I'm going to go to a break because um, it is 20 past, well, it's nearly 20 past, and I want to play some ads and hopefully cue something up that you can uh, have a listen to now in a minute. I'm just going to have a quick browse around YouTube while I go to the ads. So I'll be back in 10 minutes, folks. Take a handy and I'll talk to you very shortly. Broadcasting to Lucan, this is Liffy Sound, 96.4 FM. You're listening to Liffy Sound... On 96.4 FM. Now, folks, you're very welcome back. Now, just before the break there, I was talking about the um, excessive amount of spraying going on um, in our skies over the last few days. And it seems to be getting a lot worse. And I suppose, folks, you can expect a hell of a lot worse in the summer months to come because th there's going to be no let up. They will not let up. Um, and I think people should stand up now and start asking questions about um, what's going on. Because... As you well know, folks, what goes up must come down. So if they're spraying something in the air, we're breathing it in. And, you know, I've, I heard today, even today, just one friend of mine, two of our children are sick. One has pneumonia on the lung. Now, I'm not saying it's got out to do with chemtrails. It could be any number of reasons that he's like that. But what I'm saying is there's an awful lot of children sick. Even a friend of mine was, had reason to um, visit Our Lady's Hospital recently. And he was there for absolute hours. The place was packed with children who are not well with respiratory illnesses. Now, I'm not saying it's got out to do with the chemtrails, but, you know... It wasn't like that when I was a kid. And I remember growing up in Dublin back in the 80s when it was full of smog. There wasn't half as much sickness as there is nowadays. So, you know, I think questions need to be asked about what's been spread above our heads. And this is not just an Irish phenomenon, folks. This is going on all over the world. You know, they're blocking out the sun left, right and centre. Why? I don't know. But they are. Now, moving on. Um, I've got a little um, thing to read out. Uh, I was talking to my good friend Trevor Evers recently. 
and we were talking about the um, the event that he put on down in Walford and an absolutely fantastic event as well, the Open Minds Ireland Conference. Went off without an absolute hitch. Like, it was textbook perfect from start to finish, I have to say. I mean, from going to GamerCon there last week, which was an absolute farce, um, you know, the, whoever organised it couldn't organise a, you know, a, a booze up in the brewery, as it were. But um, this event... For, for a group of people who were putting on an event for the very first time and had never done an event like the one that they'd done um, before, I have to say it was an absolute pleasure to have attended the event and to have witnessed such a, an amazing event take place. And Trevor, as I said, relayed to me his heartfelt thanks and his absolute pride in his fellow participants who organised the event and I'm going to name them all out here now. Um, you know, he said he couldn't be more proud of um, Danny Jacob, Laura Crane, L- Lolly Crane, Jackie Ray, John Payne, Claire Cullen. And he also mentioned how he couldn't have done it without them and the next one would be even better. Well, you know, he's hoping that the next one is even better. I mean, I have to say, I was never at a conference like that before. Now, I'd gone to a few talks where it would be just one person doing a talk on, say, one particular issue, say, like, sovereignty or something like that. And I'd never ever gone to an event where you had so many different subjects, everything from banking to corruption to chemtrails to spirituality to herbalism, you know, to eating the right food. You know, if you wanted to better yourself and better the world, there was no better way to do it than to attend this conference. As I said, organised by Trevor Evers, and not just Trevor. You know, you had Danny Jacob, who's responsible for my team tune. If you're listening, Danny, thanks very much. Um, still playing the tune, still love the tune. I've no intentions of ever changing it. Um, Lolly Crane, uh, Jackie Ray, John Payne, Claire Cullen. Um, great team of people. And, you know, what I admired most about them was, I got to know Trevor, I suppose about a year ago, on Facebook, so nearly a year ago, um, when I joined the Awaken Aware in South East Ireland. Facebook page and I'm, you know, members of lots of different groups all over the internet, you know, that um, are part of the truth movement, if you want to call it that. Um, But these are great people. These are people who have woken up to corruption. They've woken up to the crap that's going on around the world. And they just wanted to do something. And, you know, Trevor got this idea that he moved it to uh, his little band of uh, merry men and women and says, how about we put on a conference? And within a year... They'd managed to get a, a great hotel in Dooley's Hotel in Walford, and it's a fabulous hotel. If you want to have a bit of crack, that's the place to have her in. Um, and put this conference on. I've got some great speakers like Mark Bierski, Garoido Coleman, you know, Tom Ryan, Ben Gilroy, um, and, and, and the list goes on and on and on. Enoch Crane, Terry Lawton. I mean, some great speakers, some brilliant subjects. I mean, even Enoch Crane's, his presentation was absolutely fantastic. Everyone's presentation was fantastic. I think the most... Um, I suppose the one that stays with me the most of everybody's presentation it had to be Mark Bierski's. His his presentation was absolutely brilliant. It was very uplifting. So you know, I just wanted to mention that anyway. Um, on behalf of Trevor, um, he wants to give his heartfelt thanks and appreciation and how proud he is of the rest of his team. You all know who you are, you know. So if you're listening in, give yourselves a pat on the back and let's let's hope that the next um, Open Minds Ireland Conference and you should do it in Dublin. I think you should and hire a bigger venue. Um, and get some big, big speakers out of it. I think he's be able to do it. Don't ever think that you can't, because I can remember Trevor ringing me up, you know, months and months ago, last September, and, you know, having a, a chat with me over the phone for nearly a half an hour to 45 minutes um, while I was out doing a bit of shopping. And how worried he was that, you know, are we going to be able to do this? Are we charging the right price for tickets? And I reminded him of something that I'd heard many, many moons ago from David Icke. And... um He'd said that when he started out back in 91, 92, when he had his epiphany and, you know, his grand awakening, whatever you want to call it, um, trying to tell people, because I remember, if you look at David Icke, when he was coming out saying that, you know, there's going to be all these cataclysms in the future, you know, floods and blah, blah, blah. But he was right about some of that stuff, I can tell you that now. Um, At the turn of the millennium, he said there was going to be, you know, catastrophes around the world. You look at just what happened in Fukushima, for example. So, you know, he wasn't, um, he wasn't bullshit. And don't get me wrong, a lot of people have turned off David Icke with his lizard theory and stuff like that. And I understand that, you know, but each of his own, you know, I always remain open-minded about everything, you know. The universe is weirder than we can even imagine it to be. So, you know, if you have any ways to close mind, you shouldn't be interested in any of this stuff. But um, as I was saying about David Icke, in relation to what, you know, Trevor and the team pulled off, when he started out, he couldn't fill a phone box. End of. He just could not fill a phone box. 
and it's taken him 25 to 30 years to build up the audience that he's got and don't get me wrong he's got thousands of followers millions of followers around the world he sells thousands of books you know he, he makes lots of documentaries he makes a good living out of it but as I said when he started out he couldn't fill a phone box now I have my doubts about David Icon I've, always, I've never been secret about that you know I always I've always thought he might be a gatekeeper, I don't know, because, you know, he, he seems to get on mainstream media quite a lot, and I think those that make it onto the mainstream media and um, get far on the mainstream media, you know, watch them with a you know, pinch of salt, roast into glasses. It's like I always say, don't take everything you hear or read or study online as fact. You have to do your own research, you know. If you don't, if you accept things blindly on blind faith alone, well, then you're doing yourself and those around you a disservice because... You know, the world is full of corruption and, you know, if you take everything as red, you're going to be led down the garden path um, into destruction. It's as simple as that. There's nothing you can do, you know. So always do your own research. Don't believe anything you hear anywhere. But as I said, David Icke, when he started out, couldn't fill a phone box. And here's Trevor and his team. Within a year of setting up that page, they filled the hotel up. So what does that tell you? So listen, lads, if you're going to do it again next year, do it bigger and do it up in Dublin and make it the biggest that way OMC event that this country's ever seen you know I mean if Game of Con can fill up the convention centre in Dublin and make a complete big share of it let's face it they did well trust me you can fill up the convention centre and make a huge success of it and I think you should so have a look into that and do it in the convention centre you know it's a good spot to do it no maybe not the convention centre no do it in the RDS that's where you should do it or maybe Croke Park be even better 80,000 seats you'd be able to sell them I'm joking anyway the next one will be a lot bigger and um, here's hoping that it is so moving on um, now last week we had I suppose what I, I would say myself based on my own observations of the news media and stuff like that and looking at a few YouTube videos um, of the event, the alleged terrorist attack in London last week where some lone nutcase lone wolf decided to drive across Westminster Bridge and smash into a few people. Um, there is a lot of talk online that it's, it is a false flag and I'm not going to pass comment on it one way or the other but what I, what I will say is there are a few discrepancies in the official story. Like for example, some woman was pulled out of the River Thames and the first thing I thought when I heard that a woman was pulled out of the River Thames, then how did she end up there in the first place? Um, if this guy crashed into a few people, how did she end up in the river? Anyway, she did. Now a video has emerged online of this woman jumping into the river but on a bungee cord. Now I don't know if that's been photoshopped into the video or whatever, but anyway, she's got a bungee cord on her. So, you know, that's me. It's a bit strange, all right. But there's a, a few other anomalies. Like, the night it happened, the news, within a couple of minutes, were naming the guy. Not only that, the passport, you know, the ubiquitous passport that they, they tend to find at these events um, was found. They found the passport, yes, an indestructible one at that as well. Um, but not only that, in today's papers, now, I've seen on the, I think it was Sky News app this morning, and this harps right the whole way back to... The alleged 7-7 bombers, who, who I've spoken about on my show before, the alleged 9-11 hijackers, and I say alleged, folks, because, you know, I don't believe the official version of any of these events because the government will lie to you and they will lie to you every time they talk to you. That's what they do. They, they're never going to give you a straight answer about anything. Now, if you cast your mind back to 9-11, what was the one thing they found on the day of 9-11? Their passports. 7-7, their passports. You know, these people tend to bring passports to these things. If I was going on a suicide mission, the last thing I'd be even thinking about when leaving the hotel room was my bloody passport. You're not going to need it. Of course, if you're getting onto a plane, but I'm talking about if you're in a city and you're going to do something, you wouldn't need it. Anyway, one of the other um, glaring similarities between 7-7, the Boston bombings, 9-11, and what happened in the UK over the last few days is that the alleged terrorist or terrorists... A couple, and they're usually Muslims, they always say they're Muslims, the night before the event, partied with beer and hookers. This is the way the newspapers describe it. Now, these are supposed to be devout, fundamental, you know, Islamists, you know, Muslims, who are fundamental about their religion. So, you know, they take it completely literally. They're not going to be the kind of people who are going to go out and have, you know, a drunken night before they launch a terrorist attack. They just wouldn't do it. Not a Muslim. Muslims don't drink, folks. So for the newspapers to be painting, you know, this alleged terrorist in such a, a light tells me that 
They're making this stuff up as they go along. They really are. You know, uh, you cast your mind back to 9-11. The hijackers partied in a bar in Florida a couple of days before the attacks. You know, why would they do that? Why would they have, you know, go drinking? These are Muslims. They're devout Muslims. They don't do that kind of thing. That's not the way they behave. You know, if they, they're looking at us, according to the mainstream media, as the infidels and that our way of life to them is disgusting and that's why we must all be destroyed. Well, why would a Muslim terrorist or an alleged Muslim terrorist go out and have a party in a bar with hookers and beer? You know, they said this guy was in a, a hotel in Brighton. I think it was Brighton, they said he was. And he was partying with hookers and having beers. Now, he's supposed to be a devout Muslim who has fundamentalist views about the West. And this is why he wants to destroy our way of life. So he's going to launch a terrorist attack. Or he's going to knock a few people down. Why would he go drinking? It doesn't make sense, folks. And, they, you know, you, people should be questioning this kind of stuff. They should really be questioning it. Now, here's another thing. The way the media is reporting this now over the last couple of days and what's going on on the street, like they're saying that London is under some sort of, you know, terrorist attack. It's not. One guy happened to drive into a bunch of people. Now, don't get me wrong, what he did, and if people did die, that's absolutely tragic. But what he did was not an attack in my opinion, not the way the mainstream media are painting it, on democracy and stuff like that. There is no democracy, folks. What's the one thing that happened in London after this attack? Security is upped. Now, if you see the, the jeeps that the, the, the London police are driving around in, these big armoured vehicles, they're not police cars, folks. These are military vehicles, and they're on the streets of London. And it's happening here, too. If you look at the guards in this country, they're getting tooled up. Left, right and centre. You know, they're getting armed more and more and more. You know, the, the mountain checkpoints now that have the guards, customs, social welfare. You've got every agency now, you know, that exists in the country stopping people going to and from work. You know, and the, the, it's under the guise of, we're checking for road tax. They're not, this is the police state being brought into being, folks. They're bringing in a police state and they're doing it here. They're doing it the world over. They're doing it all over the place. Now, I had reason last week to attend an event in Dublin um, it was a speech given by the British ambassador in relation to Brexit. Now, one of the speakers at this was Stephen Donnelly, who was an independent TD for Wicklow, I think Wicklow South. But he, when, he, when he got elected, he saw a jump ship and turned coat and joined Fianna Fáil. Now, he's supposed to be an independent, but here he is joining Fianna Fáil. Anyway, he gave a speech at it, and it was just pure rhetoric. That's all it was. All he was saying was, Brexit is bad, Brexit is bad, Brexit is bad. Trying to scare the businessmen who were there. He hadn't got a good word to say about Brexit and how bad it would be for Ireland and stuff like that. And I just think this is pure scaremongering, I really do. Don't get me wrong, the British ambassador was there speaking on behalf of Brexit, saying it's a great idea and stuff like that, blah, blah, blah. I don't know if Brexit is going to be a good idea or a bad idea. But I'll tell you what is a bad idea. Staying in the European Union and getting raped the way we have been. Now, I've said it before on this show, this country is one of the richest countries in the world. How? You look at the resources we have. You look at the fisheries around our country, the oil and the gas that we give away, folks. You know, Norway doesn't give its oil and gas away. They sell it on the open market and they split the dividends up amongst the people. That's a fact. Now, whether you know that or not, that's a fact. In Norway, everyone in Norway has a bank account. Everyone. If you're a citizen in Norway, you've got a bank account that the government put money into every single year. Don't know what the figure is, but it's in the thousands. Every single year. And what is it? It's the profits from the oil revenues. The profits are divided up amongst the people because it's their oil. It belongs to them. Now, Ireland have just as much oil as Norway, if not more. We've more gas than Norway. Norway imports us gas from Russia. So do we, funny enough, even though we have our own. But Norway imports us gas from Russia, so I'm not sure about their um, gas reserves. But their oil reserves are quite significant. Ours are supposed to be even more. You know, if you look at the territory, you can go on to billymcguire.com and there's maps on his website showing you the, the, the resource territory around this, this island. It's huge. We've got more oil and gas than probably in the, the Middle East have, and yet none of us owned it. It's all been licensed off back in the 70s to the Rockefeller Foundation and other big oil interests around the world to come here to our country, to our territory, free of charge, explore our gas and oil fields for gas and oil, strike a nice big um, load of oil or gas, take it out of the country, sell it on the open market, and we don't see a bloody penny of it. Why? Because corrupt politicians back in the 1960s and 70s sold our rights. They sold the rights to our oil and gas to foreign corporations so they could line their own pockets and look after themselves. 
That's corruption, folks. That's corruption to the highest core. That's selling the future of our nation. That's selling your children's future for a few bucks. And that's exactly what they did. And there's a great documentary, actually, on YouTube. You can go and find it. I think it's called Our Oil and Gas. And it was an Irish journalist went over to Norway with a video camera. And he was telling people in Norway what the situation here is in Ireland in relation to our oil revenues, that the Irish people don't get any of the oil revenues. And he was looking at this guy like he had two heads. He, like he was basically saying, you know, anyone that he was interviewing in Norway were looking at him and saying, are you for real? You know, you have all this oil and gas and yet your people don't benefit. He said, oh yeah, he said, that's the way it is. You know, there's massive homelessness, homelessness in Ireland. There's poverty in Ireland. And yeah, we give our oil away. We don't, we don't, uh, we don't want it. We just give it away. And if we need the oil, we buy it back. Even though it's our oil. We give it away and then we buy it back. This is how stupid we are. You know, and this, the, anyone he was talking to in Norway could not believe this. They were looking at him and saying, you know, this is nuts. Are you people actually insane? Is there something wrong with you? That you've got all these resources and here you are giving it away. Why don't you just stand up and take it back? I think people should do that. I think we should stand up as a nation and say, look, enough is enough. We've got enough problems in this country. We've got enough problems with the health system. You know, we've enough problems with corruption in government, with corruption in the ju uh, judicial system, corruption in the Garda. I mean, the, even the mainstream media all this week, with the stuff that's coming out about the guards and just sweeping it all under the carpet, it's disgusting. It really is disgusting, but that's what's going on. And as long as this corruption is allowed to continue, this country's going to go downhill and it's going to suffer. And it's up to us, it's up to this generation to stand up and do something about it. You know, whether that's doing a radio show, whether it's even getting out in the street and protesting, it doesn't matter. Don't get me wrong, I'm not a big fan of protesting, but... Sometimes it works, but it only works if the numbers are there. You know, if you get a few hundred people protesting about a single issue, no one cares. The government certainly don't care. They're not going to listen to you. But if you get up to over 100,000 people protesting about a single issue, they've got no choice. They have to listen. It's as simple as that. And that's what needs to happen in this country. People need to stand up and say, look, enough is enough. You know, this is our country. It doesn't belong to you. It doesn't belong to the corporations. It belongs to we, the people. And that's exactly how it belongs to you. But it doesn't seem that way. You look, like I, at this event the other night, this Brexit event, <coughs> I was shocked, I suppose, at the, the stupidity of some of the speakers who were on stage. Because I was listening to them and I was listening to what they were saying about Brexit and it was pure, pure scaremongering. You know, you have to remember, the European Union is not even 50 years old yet. And every single country that's a member of it were existing prior to that and prospering prior to that. Maybe not to the extent that we prosper these days, but, you know, they were getting by. People had food in their bellies, you know, they had a roof over their heads. You know, in the 1950s, the homeless crisis in this country was nowhere near as what it is now. So why is that? You know, people had somewhere to live back then. Yes, they probably weren't living in luxury. That's not the point. They had somewhere to live. But not anymore. Now it's a rat race, you know. It's a, it's a miracle if you, if you manage to land your first home. It's a miracle if you manage to get a place off the council. This is how bad things are in this country. There's thousands of people living in hotels. I mean, hotels are supposed to be for travelling guests. They're not meant for the settled community. And you have to settle it. You know, there's thousands of people from the settled community living in hotels. Why is that? Because the nation has been stripped of its wealth, giving our oil and gas away, giving our fisheries away. You know, I was talking to a guy in work this morning, and we were talking about what the EU has ever given to Ireland. Now, we don't know the exact figure of how much money this country has benefited from the European Union, but when you weigh it against... Our own natural resources, our oil, our gas, our fisheries, our forests. What they've given us is infinitesimal compared to what this country is really worth. And here we are, coming up to 2020, and we've got to pay off a debt of 58 billion to unknown gamblers, people we don't even know the names of. People, when you ask in the government who these people are, they don't even know the names of. And yet here we are paying this debt off. Plus the interest. And how are you going to pay the interest off on that debt? Well, you have to go to these people and put them all money off and just to pay them back the interest. This is how farcical it is, folks. But it doesn't have to be that way. If you think about our natural gas, for example, it's worth billions. Absolute billions. So if we were to take the licences back off the people that we gave it to and start pumping that gas ourselves and selling that gas ourselves, we'd pay our national debt in 12 months. And that's just the gas. Don't mention the oil. I mean, the oil is worth absolute billions. Can you imagine what you could do with the educational system with that kind of money? Instead of wasting it. Instead of giving it away. Because this is what they're doing. They're giving our money away. And why are they giving it away? Because they're greedy. You know, you have to remember, the people who signed these licences over, they might have Irish accents, they might have been born in this country, but they're not Irish nationalists. They don't give a toss about this country. They never have. It's like David Rockefeller. 
You know, a lot of people think, oh, well, he's American. He cares about America. No, he doesn't. Well, he didn't. He's dead now. And I, mean, I don't think he got a decent obituary on the internet last week. There wasn't one person who was too sad to see him go. Anyway, he said in his memoirs that he published in, I think it was 1992, 93, the early 90s, he published his memoirs. And then he said, me and my family have been accused of being globalists that we're trying to bring about a one world government and destroy all nation states around the world in, and have it ruled over by a banking elite. He said, if that's the charge, I stand guilty and I'm proud. And he said that in his own mem memoirs. And he, he went as far as to say that the world would prefer to be ruled by a banking elite than to be self-governed by, you know, Gambian nation states doing their own thing because they're not smart enough to do their own thing, that people need to be ruled by the rich. This is how these people think. You know, this is how David Rockefeller thinks. I mean, he, here's a man who died at 101 after seven heart transplants. You know, he should have given up the ghost after his first one. You know, he had his time on earth, but now he wanted to stay around for as long as he could. And I say his biggest, biggest regret in life was not seeing the New World Order coming into being. I say that's his biggest regret. But let's hope that with the death of David Rockefeller, it spells the death of the New World Order because they are being exposed, folks. There's no doubt about that. They've been exposed, and I think they're up in their game. This is where you had that farcical false flag event in London the other day. And I will call it that because that's where it was. It was a farce. It's like the Boston bombing says another farce. This is what I was getting back to earlier on about Hollywood being involved in all of this as well. Look at the movie that's come out now called Patriots Day with Mark Wahlberg. It's all about the Boston bombings and how the, tar the, the um, Sarniav brothers, you know, planted these bombs and tried to kill all these people at a marathon. I mean, that was probably... And even if you're not in interested in the troop movement, that was probably the most blatant false flag I've ever seen. That was so blatantly fake and obviously fake. You know, down to some of the victims on the streets, it was that fake. You know, even, uh, I think it was The Simpsons that aired the day before, predicted it. You know, they have to tell you in the Hollywood movies, by the way, what they're going to do. And um, it was in The Simpsons just the day before. This is how sloppy they're getting. You know, the, 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 the rushing these events, the, to anyone who knows what to be looking for, they're, they're glaringly obvious what's going on. That this is here, uh, this is a false flag event, this is not real. And they're getting desperate, and I think they're desperately, desperately trying to bring in the one more government. And this is one of the years that they're really going to push for it. I mean, watch out now next month, April. I always call April, and I've said this on the show before, the month of sacrifice. There's been an awful lot of sacrifices going on during April, so watch out for some big terrorist attacks or some high-profile celebrity deaths. You always get them in April. April's always the month for the folks. And, you know, it's one of those strange months. Anyway, I'm going to go to some ads and um, I'll be back in a couple of minutes. So let me uh, just line that up there. Yeah, there's the ads now. So I'm going to go to some ads, folks. I'll be back in a couple of minutes. Take a handy. You're listening to Liffy Sound, www.liffysoundfm.ie. Listen online, community radio at its best. Local programs, local presenters, local news. Tune to Liffy Sound 96.4 FM. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you're very welcome back. Um, I've got about 10, 15 minutes there or thereabouts left of the show. Um, just before um, the break there, I was talking about the event there in London. And um, I've got a friend up here, but he's not coming on there. But he did mention to me there during the break that um, on Sky News, about two days before that attack in London, they were showing um, a drill that was taking place in and around that bridge, Waterloo Bridge. I think it's Waterloo, or Westminster Bridge. And... They were running drills. Now, that is a, for me anyway, that's a, a sure, surety, I suppose, that there's going to be uh, a terrorist attack imminent. If you see them running drills, run. That's what I always say, run. If you see them running the drill, run. 9-11, on the day of 9-11, and this is common knowledge, folks, they were running drills, and here's the mad thing about it. The drills that they were running, the scenario of the drills that they were running were of planes crashing into the World Trade Centre, so they were running the exact same drills for the exact same scenario that took place on the day. So when, and the, you can go on to the uh, YouTube and look at the video clips of the news. It's not just documentaries that people made. You can look at video clips of the news on the day where the, the reporters were saying that, um, oh, there's drills going on. You know, there was a, a drill going on at the same time and the scenario was the same. And... Um, the, the, you know, the, those at NORA, they didn't know whether this was real war or just a drill. You know, and this is why they, the, the excuse they used for screwing up 
the the response effort on the day and um, there was no planes available to go uh, you know shadow these jets that were heading uh, towards New York so it was a, a complete shambles but as I said they ran drills on the same day and the scenario of those drills was identical to what actually took place on the day and the same applies to 7-7 on the day of 7-7 there was a guy who went on television and I believe he should, this guy should be getting questioned in relation to this um, as part of a criminal investigation but he probably never will be along with Tony Blair but um, this guy uh, I can't remember his name Peter Power yeah that was his name Peter Power he was wo- he was the boss of a consultancy firm called Visor Consultants and he went on Sky News on that day on the day of 7-7 and he said and I kid you not that his company were running a drill for about a thousand office workers and the nature of their drill was simultaneous bombs going off on tubes trains and a bus at the exact locations that everything went down on. So what does that tell you? You know, they were running the drill for the exact same scenario, and here we go. These alleged bombers carry out the exact same scenario. Folks, these false flags are designed for one thing and one thing only, to increase security. It's called problem, reaction, solution. What they do is, they create the problem, i.e. a big terror attack in the streets of London. Then they wait on the reaction. That's the public outcry. Oh my God, we're not safe. What are you going to do about it? And then you get the reaction or the um, solution of the government. Oh, we'll, we'll increase security. We'll stick cameras everywhere. We'll put armed guards on every street corner. How's that for you? Oh, lovely. I feel so much safer now. Thank you for protecting my freedoms. This is how naive and stupid people are. That this is going on right under your nose. We can see it going on and yet we accept it. As I said, folks, they're bringing in a one world government. They're starting it with the European super state. They're desperate to get that in. What Britain's part in all of this, I do not know. I mean, I find it ironic because most of what goes on around the world, the Brits are behind it. When I, when I say the Brits, I mean the Crown, which is not British people. The Crown is a private corporation, folks. And they're the ones that really run the show, along with, with the likes of the Vatican. And Washington, D.C. being the military wing of all of this, Vatican being the religious and London being the financial. But, um, you know... I don't know what their part is, you know, with this Brexit idea and stuff like that. Why, you know, Britain are getting out of the European Union when, you know, I see them as being behind it. But um, I don't know what, I don't know why, that, it may be some sort of self-preservation on their part, who knows. But um, if they bring in a, a European super state, well then, you're going to have the European Union super state. You've already got the North American Union, you know, you've got Mexico and Canada. Now, maybe not so much Mexico now with Donald Trump in power. But George Bush Jr., George Bush Sr., Bill Clinton and Barack Obama, but all between the four of them, have tried to cement relations between Canada, South, uh, Mexico and America to create a union, just like the European Union. Now, I mean, you look at America's made up of 50 states or 51 states, wherever it is. Um, Mexico then is one big country. Canada's made up of uh, several provinces. But all of that coming together is one massive big union. Then you've got the European Union, you've got the African Union, and then you would have the Asia Pacific Union. That's four big unions. Are four, is it four, four, four big unions on the planet: European Union, American Union, African Union, and East Asia, East Asian Union. Now the Russians, of course, they'd be frozen out. They'd be doing their own thing, etc., etc., etc. But um, that was the plan, and I don't think that plan is on course now anymore because you've got England now bailing out the European Union, effectively putting the European Union on the back foot. You've got Scotland then wanting independence from Britain. You've got Ireland calling for um, an IREX, and I think we should have one. I think we should have a referendum on whether we stay in the European Union or not. As I said, this this country's rich, folks. We don't need to be in the European Union. We can build our own roads. We can build our own houses. We can build our own skills. We've got the skills there. I mean, Ireland is probably one of the most skilled nations in the world. And we are. You just look at the talent that comes out of this country and it's all farmed out to, to other countries. They get to, to benefit from our intellect and our intelligence, but, um, you know, they leave all the useful idiots at home to do the mundane tasks over here, I suppose, and they ship off the, the smartest of the, the, the class to foreign climes to uh, do the bidding of the new world order, I suppose, in different countries. But um, if they do bring in a one more government system folks it's, it's game over it's game over for us all and I think they're desperately desperately trying to uh, bring it in now I mean if you look in this country for example with the guards and how corrupt 
that they're now being exposed as being. I mean, look at the penalty point system, for example. Over a million, this is just one new story over the last few days, over a million breath tests over-exaggerated. They never occurred. So they're fudging the figures, folks. They're trying to make it look good. They're not breathalyzing people out there. There's even thousands of penalty point convictions now are up for um, debate. You know, it's an absolute farce. And now what they're doing is they're trying to, I suppose, blindside you with different media stories that will like, grab your attention. One of the big stories in the, in the media at the moment is the corruption going on within Ungarda Shea and the fact that it's been exposed by great people like Morris McCabe and John Wilson and others, other whistleblowers, who have been drummed out of force because they're speaking out about the corruption that's going on at the, the upper echelons. But what do they do then? They stick out a new story there this morning, for example, like the this new TV licence story, which has uh, caught everybody's attention because it involves people's computers and iPads and phones, etc., etc., and no one is happy with it. This is just them getting desperate. This new... TV licence, broadcasting charge, whatever you want to call it, that's going to apply to anything that can display an image. Um, it's more, I think, to do with stifling your freedom of speech. And this is a, from a post I read earlier on from Finn from People's Internet Radio, and he, he put a good post up about this. Because so, he's reading between the lines, and he's right. This has more to do with stifling freedom of speech. When you think about it, we all communicate via our laptops and tablets and stuff like that and phones, Facebook and stuff like that. We don't watch the mainstream media anymore. We don't watch the news because we know it's propaganda. We know it's all bullshit. So, you know, most people do their communicating now through Facebook, but they want to license that now. They want to license it. They want to make it a criminal offence to do it. Unless you've got a license. And that's, that's the mad thing about a license, folks. Ask yourself this. If you don't have a license to drive a car and you drive a car... How does a guard who stops you view you? He views you as somebody who's committing a criminal offence. Now, go off and apply for a licence. What are you getting a licence for? You're getting a licence to commit what is otherwise known as a criminal offence. So by applying for a licence to drive a car, they're giving you a licence to commit a criminal offence because without a licence they're telling you you're committing a criminal offence. Now think about that for a moment. It's something I've certainly thought about. Now, I think it's something more thinking about. What is a licence? A licence is when the government takes your ability away to do something and then sells it back to you. With their permission, of course. And now they're trying to do the same with communications. They're trying to say that if you've got, got a, a laptop, an iPad, a computer, it doesn't matter. And you can watch RTE and a billion other TV stations, am I, lad? Well, then you must pay RTE. Now, I think RTE, in my opinion, should be shut down. It should be gone. Close it down or privatise it, one or the other. Because I think the days where you expect the citizens of a state to have to sit back and pay to listen to nothing but pure propaganda, bullshit and lies from a state broadcaster that I c- couldn't give you a straight answer if they were paid to, who have overpaid under-talented stars. And I'm not saying I'm any talent by any stretch of the imagination. I'm not, I'm just a voice on the radio. But if you look at what we have to put up on a Friday night with Ryan Toberty and the Late Late Show and the crap that is on it and the propaganda that is on it, you know, they should be talking about real issues. They should have somebody on there, say, from the hub, talking about the amount of people who are getting evicted from this country week in, week out. That's what the national broadcaster was set up to do. That's what it's for. If they wanted to be the people's broadcaster, well, then start telling the truth. But don't start demanding that you double the licence fee just because people have computers and don't have to listen to your propaganda anymore, where they can go away, listen to what they want to listen to online and do their own research online and find their own truths. And not have to listen to the bullshit that the mainstream media put out as truth and as fact. When it's not. You know, you see a story in the headlines, simple bit of research and you can debunk most of them. That's all you've got to do, a simple bit of research and you can debunk most of them. Because that's all it is, it's all propaganda, that's all you're going to get in the mainstream media. You're going to get lies, bullshit and propaganda. They're never going to tell you the truth, never. They're not going to tell you the truth about Morris McCabe. They're not going to tell you the truth about John Wilson. They're not going to tell you the truth about the chewing baby scandal. They'll just brush it all under the carpet, folks, because that's what they do. That's what the mainstream media does. The mainstream media is not there for the people anymore. It's nothing more than a propaganda machine. It's like Adolf Hitler, or was it Joseph Goebbels, said it. You want to tell a lie, tell it big enough. And keep telling it, and eventually it becomes the truth. And that's what the mainstream media does. They do nothing but tell you lies, and keep telling you lies, and keep telling you lies, and eventually those lies become the truth. This is what they do. So, turn off your televisions. And, you know, I'm not telling anybody not to get a TV licence. If you want to get a TV licence, you don't get one, I don't care. It doesn't bother me if you get one. But ask yourself, 
Are you lawfully obliged to have one? Because if you're not, I think you should be asking questions. Really, I really do. But um, if you feel that you should have one, we'll go out and get one. By all means, go out and get one. But, you know, do you have to have one? I don't know. Anyway, folks, I have come up to the end of the show. And um, as usual, it's been a good show. I've enjoyed having a rant here tonight. But um, remember, folks, the world is full of great people. And if you can't find one, simply be one. Until next week, folks, take a handy. This has been The World You Don't Know. Touch is all very soon. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret society, to secret oath, and to secret proceedings. Waking humanity, one soul at a time. This is The World You Don't Know Radio Show with your host, Nick O'Connell.